Uh, thanks, everyone. So thanks so much for coming. Uh, and today, we want to invite you to navigate a question with us from some ongoing research concerning the deaths of migrating persons uh, along the US-Mexico border. Uh, we work on a few projects in this area. Uh, most of those involve data that comes directly from medical legal professionals. But this particular project, we're exploring um, trying to find uh, other sources, especially that might address uh, gaps in the data uh, that could document uh, um, where deceased persons have been found. Um, so in this talk, we're going to just go over a few of the uh, core contexts and challenges uh, with this data, and then show you some exploratory mapping we've been doing, um, really to pull out uh, you know, what are different kinds of ways we could potentially work with this data long term. Um, and then we'd love to hopefully open it up for discussion with you. Uh, would love to hear if you've been working with mapping uh, text-based data of any kind, or perhaps mapping uh, something related to humanitarian crises or conditions where limited data is available. Um, so, to kind of ground uh, where we go in general, um, we just want to acknowledge that we try to work in the consciousness that every data set comes from a context with points of view and relations of power into how it's uh, generated. Uh, and every one, of course, has gaps and silences very much, including the one that we're working with here. Um, we also strive to keep awareness of our positionality in relation to the vulnerabilities of uh, migrating persons um, and their families. Um, we are both uh, we've both lived in uh, border states, but not currently directly on the border, um, and don't have uh, recently migrated persons in our direct family, and always uh, looking for input from those uh, with different experiences on how our maps uh, and data representations can be better. And then any mapping project that deals with the border, of course, uh, is looking at that construct of what a border is, um, which of course, uh, in reality, is all kinds of different lived experiences where um, people cross borders and borders cross people. Um, the specific border that we're looking at in our work here is, uh, we'll refer to as the US Southwestern border, uh, though of course it's many other things as well. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to you, Molly. All right, so let's come together uh, around this, uh, the, the encompassing question that guides our interest on this project, researching migrant deaths along the U.S.-Mexico border, with today our focus being deaths reported on the U.S. side. How might we visualize this humanitarian crisis phenomenon that has been ongoing? Um, and as part of this, our objectives are to really harness a qualitative information source, local newspapers, um, and to see how that might inform our understanding of ongoing migrant deaths. And associated with that, and given our source, analyzing newspaper articles um, and what that means in the narration of this particular type of death. So, um, the humanitarian bit of our research, we've been doing this in different ways for uh, a little over 10 years. And it does serve accounting purposes, where accounting is something where it's the beginning of a process. We can't proceed with action without some information and good information, right? Um, but we don't mean to diminish the event of death in numbers. And to the point, there are, in fact, maps about deaths along the border, uh, U.S.-Mexico border. This is a map from the International Organization on Migration. Um, here's a map of just one jurisdiction in Texas, Brooks County, Texas. It's in the south of Texas. In this one area alone, you can kind of see that the, the points on the map kind of stop. Those are stopping within the boundaries of that jurisdiction, and that's 800 cases alone in one place in South Texas. Um, accounting that happens between states, Texas and New Mexico, you can see nothing goes into what is northern Mexico there. Um, that's about 200 or so cases. Um, and then finally, a map that we have learned from a great deal, which is accounting for migrant deaths in southern Arizona since at least uh, the early thousands, although they have cases going back into the uh, 1990s and 1980s. This is a particular favorite map of ours. It's interactive, it can be queryable. All these are queryable publicly, 
but this is the only map that we know of publicly available that has uh, an estimate of positional accuracy associated with those point locations, which is to say this is the best map that anyone could use and uh, apply meaningful geospatial analyses. Yes, so, um, you know, that, that map, you know, really, there's a lot of care put into the uh, um, attending to the data, the geospatial data on that map to make the point uh, data as accurate as possible or um, any, uh, you know, variance in the point data uh, um, discoverable by an end user. Um, this project, quite the opposite. We're working with uh, text narratives that do not have uh, point data uh, inherent to them um, and that have very qualitative descriptions uh, of space and place in relation to deceased migrating persons in South Texas. Aha, are you getting whiplash between the two of us? Um, a little bit more about our data source. We have collected a little over 300 individual newspaper articles, all from local South Texas newspapers. Um, that mention in some way a migrant death or perhaps more than one death event. And um, this is strategic on our part because, um, yes, newspapers are biased, but what this lets us do is we get a local narrative of a particular type of death, and we get the point of view of an area, uh, multiple communities that are subject to deaths at any point, and sometimes literally in their own backyards. And we'll show you an example of what we did to take the text and um, put it into a spreadsheet so we could start to explore with map visualization. So again, we had spoken about these limitations before, um, but please remember this is the beginning of a process. We did want a bias source and we're really looking into what is the potential and what can we truly know when we're using an unstructured text source. So let's look at an excerpt of text from one article. Taking this, uh, an unidentified male victim was pulled from the Rio Grande River. Tuesday from the grounds of Hernandez Ranch on Highway 83 sometime in the morning. So for the purposes of going from PDF to spreadsheet, we would pull out these critical pieces of palatial information. The Rio Grande River, a ranch uh, owned property, um, a major roadway. Here's another example. We get another ranch, private property, we actually get distance and direction with this excerpt, 18 miles southeast, Eagle Pass, major city, and another major highway, 277. So what we're dealing with here is, location is out of the question if we're thinking about GPS coordinate locations or something else that um, would be precise um, in that way. Um, instead, we're dealing with locale, you know, the material context of a place or an incident or where uh, human and land interactions can happen, and also sense of place. And so please keep those aspects of place in mind when we start to show you eventually our map visualizations. So here's some more examples. These are the kinds of uh, uh, location information and challenges that we're really interested in trying to map. Um, again, because uh, unfortunately for certain counties and certain time periods, there is not clear uh, medical, legal, forensic information available on these deaths. Uh, so just trying to find other ways to get at how do we uh, get to documentation of what's happened and get a more accurate and just accounting for the people who have died and better understand What's, what's been happening over time. Um, so yeah, just very interesting uh, data to work with. Um, so we started this project uh, as sort of a, almost a, <laughs> a mixtape kind of thing where we, we were each do things on our own and then present to the other uh, works in progress and different experimentations uh, with extractions from the text data um, and how to place it in different um, map forms. Um, so uh, we're really thinking of this as small uh, prototypes uh, to try to understand 
understand what's in the data that's useful and mappable that we can get out uh, to understand better um, what it's representing. So uh, uh, we, I consider these more sketches. I think that's the term we were talking about. Uh, and they're not, um, I just want to say because we're at NASIS and there's so many gorgeous, incredible maps here. Uh, these uh, prototypes are not design prototypes of any kind um, looking at all aesthetically. They were really prototypes to look at data content and how um, how mappable in points, polygons, or other ways these locations were, and what other kinds of information from the text might be placed within the maps uh, in order to tell something of this story. So um, with that. All right, we'll start with some uh, test exploration uh, images that I created. Uh, so we, we have a sample of a little over 300 articles. This is me working with um, about 70, so subset. Um, but the focus here is from these articles, I would pull out the mention of a place that would be most familiar to people who live in this area, residents. So what you'll notice with this map and, and the symbology I chose um, is kind of grouped by um, a theme. So let's see, my, oh dear. <laughs> On the uh, northwest extent of this map, you'll see sort of a cluster of blue that's bisected by what is the Rio Grande River. Ooh, I can just move. You'll see a lot of blue dots here. Um, those are news articles, individual uh, reports of death in the Rio Grande River, and it happens to be near a major city of Laredo. Um, another typical place uh, a deceased person was found that would be knowable to someone who would read this news article in this area are um, ranches. There's so many private ranches, well, all over Texas. Most of Texas is privately owned. So you'll see little squares with different colors. Uh, many, the, most of them here are ranches. And then, of course, major roads also are very common because uh, the, uh, in the act of migration and avoiding detection, um, what we've learned by talking to people here is avoid detection, but try to kind of make sure you know where the road is, otherwise you'll never find your way to a major city. Um, another exploration uh, where you can see my existential crisis and just trying to place a point on a map where I'm going, okay, south of a city and two miles off this major road, and so I'm in the middle of a field, and I could put this point anywhere at, that, at, at this juncture. So what we're looking here is any of the 70 news stories that I was working with, if cardinal directions were also included in the description. So it would be most useful if you're like, well, how do I get to this site of death? Well, the newspaper says off Highway 77, <laughs> from here you might not be able to see it, but major Highway 77, um, go two, two miles off it, but you're approaching the site from a southeast of the town Sarita, or something like that. So I get wedge buffers and ring buffers, if ring buffers being this is a site where I could kind of figure out approximately what they're talking about, but there's no direction for approach. And um, then for, for my uh, part, I decided to really focus on this idea of small data, so as opposed to big data, so spending a lot of time with a very small subset of the data. So I only looked at the cases where a deceased person was found in Laredo, and um, I tried to uh, go into the narratives to try to map those as points as best as possible, which was sometimes more possible than others. And what I wanted to do was then, um, having those points, uh, pull out discrete pieces, phrases from the text of the larger narrative that might point to something in the story, uh, that might be something we could know about the death, though of course we never get the story of the person migrating themselves, right? But something we can know um, about uh, the death discovery, and perhaps what the reader, um, the person reading the article who is a local resident might uh, learn about what's happening in their place, uh, uh, the places near them, through um, the experience of reading the article. Uh, they may also themselves have, of course, uh, seen other traces, uh, experienced witnessing um, of um, uh, apprehensions, uh, and also perhaps found remains themselves. Um, 
so what I came out of, uh, what was on my mind after doing these uh, multiple small prototypes was really the question of that sense of place and how it it may change for residents, um, especially perhaps as memory, and, and I went to memory studies a bit to think about witnessing and whether perhaps the change in the sense of place, like knowing that your local um, shopping center or park had been the site of uh, different death discoveries uh, might change uh, the local resident's sense of place and, and that itself could be leaving a, a trail of, of a kind of witnessing of these events. Um, and that's something I'm hoping to think about more in our next stages. Um, and then lastly, uh, just because the point data positioning was very difficult, um, in some cases, often there were phrases where it would be like the 4400 block of Oleander Boulevard, but in fact then the death discovery was listed as being lifted out of the river, and in fact there's quite a distance and, and probably a downward grade between those things. So trying to think about, um, you know, what are some polygon-based ways, shape-based ways that would follow the path of the description of the death scene, so the river, um, the canyon, the hiking trail, um, but that also attend to the fact that in the record it does say it's related to this street, so there's something between those spaces um, happening. Um, and I, I did think that this represented the narrative better in terms of the description of place, but I do worry that these large extents of color uh, on a visual basis might give a different sense, because this is not multiple deaths, it's one death that could have happened in any of those places uh, along that polygon. So um, with that, uh, I think we'll go ahead and get into just uh, reflecting on the experience and hopefully discussing with you um, so that we have a few minutes for that because uh, we really would love to hear um, any uh, comments you might have about qualitative mapping uh, or mapping um, humanitarian crises or borders. Um, these are some of the things that we're thinking about as we move forward with this project and some others uh, as well. Would anyone like to? All right. Uh, have you thought about also mapping like the qualitative terms that are used in the newspaper articles or not mapping them, but sort of like what sort of themes, how they talk about the people? Um, is there specific themes in which the journalist is writing about the people? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And um, uh, I would say, I don't know if we thought about mapping it, but definitely tracking it and visualizing it in some way. And I don't know if, Molly, you want to speak to what you did in terms of um, some of the work you did that was more in that, that flow graph. So I don't have the data with me here, but among all, all these 300-plus uh, papers, I did a few like term frequencies. And at least with local, and there were four local headquartered newspapers that we have here, um, there wasn't any sort of temporal or preferential use of a word for migrant, pardon the phrase, illegal alien came up. Like we would search these terms just to retrieve, you know, query these articles to gather our data. Um, rather than there being a pattern of which word was used, it was more, um, there was a weird temporal thing where there was an uptick in 2012, and 2012, uh, there was a huge increase in deaths seen in Texas compared to other border states like Southern Arizona, Southern California, and what have you. So there's a little bit of a weird temporal thing that seems to match flows of migration. Um, but since it is newspaper data, I would be hesitant to read too much into that. And then a larger, is there racism obvious in these words? Not so much because they were so varied between migrant, immigrant, undocumented person, and things like that. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just say that, you know, that question of do we show the source data when that kind of text is in it uh, is a question as well. Sorry. Thanks. Um, this, uh, this, is a, this may be a problematic question. You can tell me if it is. I, I think what, what came to mind for me with this idea of, like, estimating directions from the stories or, like, thinking about those circle radius, I actually think it's a really compelling idea, and it actually had me go a little further in that concept it, you know, it ceases to become data and maybe a little bit more interpretation, but I'm wondering, like, are there ways you can extrapolate potential methodologies that may have led to the event, like a heat event or a water crossing event, and, and maybe actually visualize what could have led to the, the death occurring and maybe having that be the visual, just to give 
the impression of the experience of that migrant who was moving through the landscape and what might have caused them to, to find the ending that they found as a way of sort of taking that question of, we don't actually know exactly where this thing was, but maybe we can make an assumption about what might have happened here to give a, a more general sense of the experience. That's okay. Uh, it's a great idea. We, we don't have time. I will say that um, modeling, say, environment or energy expenditure, things like that. I, I, ha I have a few public, one, I have one publication about that and have worked with others who have done more on that. Um, now in Texas, it's more complicated. Long-term storage of unidentified deceased people, they will be buried, so people get lost all over again. Anyone, it's just a majority of unidentified deaths in Texas are migrants, as it turns out, compared to the resident population. Uh, Find me later, let's talk about it. Um, yes, please time. find us later. We, we have um, other projects we work on with forensic data we would love to talk to you about as well, um, non-narrative data. Thanks so much. Thank